Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on today's instalment of the Reorg Asia webinar series. We will get started shortly as more people join. Okay, today we will be discussing Vedanta Resources, one of India's largest high yield issuers and one of the most volatile Asian credits. The title of the webinar is Vedanta Resources, Funding Gaps, Prospective Plans, and the THL Zinc Deal. I am delighted to be joined for this discussion by three of my colleagues, Director and Senior Credit Analyst Jungwa, who is based in Singapore, India Editor Malvika, who is based in Mumbai, and Credit Analyst Ken, who is based in Hong Kong. Welcome Malvika, Jungwan and Ken. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, before we get going, some of the usual housekeeping items to mention. Please submit questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A widget located on the bottom of your screen. And a replay of the webinar with slides will be available on the Real webinar and podcast page within 24 hours for Real subscribers. Right, let's kick off our discussion on Vedanta. Ken will first provide a business overview and discuss the company's maturity profile. Jungguan will then touch on some thinking around liquidity. After that, Malvika will guide us on some of the current market sentiments around the proposed THL deal and the potential financing. And finally, I will talk about the credit structure of the company's dollar bonds. So Ken, if you could start us off by providing a business overview of the Danta resources to set the scene, please. Yeah, sure, Jeff. So uh, first, let me briefly introduce the revenue component and also corporate structure of Vedanta Resources. Vedanta Resources is a diversified natural resources company headquartered in the UK. And it is also the largest mining company in India with operations in Australia and Zambia. So the company's operations are mainly conducted through its 69.7% owned subsidiary Vedanta Limited. Its Singh operations are mainly held by Hindustan Singh Limited, which is 64.9% owned by Vedanta Limited. So as seen from the top left-hand side, the aluminium and also domestic Singh business are the two largest revenue components of Vedanta Limited. Together, they contribute around 900 billion Indian rupees revenue for the last 12 months ending December 2022 or around 60% of the revenue of Vedanta Limited. Uh, however, when it comes to EBITDA, the situation changes slightly. Hindustan Singh, which produce Singh, lead, and also silver, contribute nearly half of EBITDA of Vedanta Limited. And it's worth noting that Hindustan Singh is only 64.92% owned by Vedanta Limited, and upstream dividends from Hindustan Singh is subject to two rounds of minority leakage before reaching Vedanta resources. So to understand this, let's take a closer look at the simplified corporate structure of Vedanta resources on the right-hand side. As you may see, all the offshore USD notes are issued at Vedanta Resources Limited and also the intermediate holding company level. Jeff will further elaborate on this corporate structure later. As most of the uh, Vedanta resources operations are conducted below the whole code, the dividend substreamed from its opcos, especially from Vedanta Limited and also Hindustan Singh, have been important liquidity source for debt servicing. However, the dividend upstream from Hindustan Singh is subject to two rounds of minority leakage. For every dollar of dividend declared by Hindustan Singh, Assuming it's fully passed through to Vedanta Resources, it will only receive $0.45 before considering the withholding tax effects. And looking at the lower right corner, in fiscal 223, it was starting declared free interim dividends, totaling 209 billion Indian rupees. Vedanta Limited, in the same period, has also declared four interim dividends with a total amount of 301 billion Indian rupees. And we estimate that the minority leakage of dividends upstreamed to be around 165 billion Indian rupees or 2 billion US dollars. So perhaps to reduce a round of minority leakage, in January, Hindustan Singh announced a plan to acquire Singh International Business from Vedanta Limited for 2.98 billion US dollars. 
And if this is further upstreamed, we estimate that this could bring in around 2 billion US dollars to Fadanta resources. Significantly, plugging its fiscal 224's funding gap. However, we see there are some objections to this deal in the market, especially the Indian government, which is the second largest shareholder in Hindustan Singh. The main concerns in the market are the possibility of a major liquidity drag at Hindustan Singh and also the potential corporate governance issues. My colleagues Zhongguang, Jeff and Malvika will talk more about this later in their sessions. Thanks very much for that, uh, Ken, that overview of Vedanta resources, the profit drivers and the, and the corporate structure, and structure really, really very helpful. Do you think you could uh, now spend some time talking about one of the major concerns for investors, its debt maturity profile? Yeah, sure, Jeff. Uh, next slide, please. Yep, so uh, for last year, Vedanta Resources announced its plan to deleverage 4 billion US dollar over three years. As guided by the management in its uh, January earnings call, Vedanta Resources has delivered around 2 billion US dollars in the first 11 months of fiscal 223, and also report a net debt level of 7.7 .7 billion US dollars as of January. This means that as of today, the company has reached the halfway point of its 4 billion US dollar deleveraging target. And um, as you may see from the left hand side, we have mapped out the loan repayments and also the new borrowings incurred by Vedanta Resources whole code during the period. We can see that the support from public banks plays a key role in the company's deleveraging plan, especially when it comes to refinancing its existing debt. Apart from the uh, public bank support at the lower left corner, we can see that the main liquidity source for Vedanta Resources are the dividend upstream from its subsidiaries and also the brand fees it received from Vedanta Limited. We estimate that the cash level for Vedanta Resources uh, after performa for the cash received and also the debt movements to be around 360 million US dollar at the end of January. So this implies that Vedanta Resources liquidity profile will be challenging in the next few fiscal quarters. And as you may see from the right hand side, Vedanta Resources face 1.7 billion US dollars maturities in the first quarter of fiscal 224. So this includes a 400 million and a 500 million US uh, dollar offshore note, and also a, 100, a 250 million US dollars of auxiliary loan amortization and also one 100 million US dollar of DBS credit facility. We believe that there could be some flexibilities around a 300 million US dollar intercompany loan, which is borrowed from the overseas subsidiaries of Vedanta Limited. However, even if we exclude the intercompany loan, Vedanta resources will still face 3 billion US dollar maturities in fiscal 224 with the largest maturities in the first fiscal quarter. So with the estimated cash balance of 360 million US dollar at the end of January, the liquidity looks tight to us. Thanks for setting that out so clearly, Ken. Uh, Jungwon, let me uh, bring you in and ask you to maybe further discuss the company's prospective funding gap. Hey, sure, Jeff. Uh, in a test sheet that uh, the team published last month, we took, a, we took a step further by modeling out the prospective uh, funding gap that Vedanta Resources, or what I will call VRL, uh, will be experiencing uh, in the coming uh, quarters and two, next two fiscal years. So what we did was uh, we, use, uh, we use consensus median commodity prices and historical performance metrics. Uh, and we estimated VRL's uh, fiscal 24 and fiscal 25 funding gaps would be from roughly 2.1 billion to 2.6 billion each year, depending on uh, whether we are using the base case or worst case uh, assumptions uh, in, in our modeling. So this funding gap, uh, the, the funding gaps that I've just mentioned, uh, they are in the context of uh, principal and debt servicing burden of uh, 3.4 billion to 3.6 uh, billion dollars in the next two fiscal years. Uh, but without looking as far out and simply focusing on the more uh, immediate term, uh, we think VRL needs to resolve a 1.7 billion maturity, what was kind of alluded to earlier, uh, by the first uh, fiscal quarter 
uh, of 2024, ending June 30th of this year. Now, uh, based on company disclosures and our estimates, uh, we think VRLs ending cash balance uh, this month could be in the range of call it 300 to 350 million dollars. So suggesting a, a fairly sizable gap as it is over the next uh, four calendar months as it tries to address the 1.7 billion wall. Uh, we also think that in the absence of a concrete plan, uh, the US dollar bonds could see significant volatility in the short term. And I think we are already seeing uh, a few points uh, of movement uh, today. So all of that said, I think uh, there are still some positive recent developments that could be potentially helpful to VRL in coming up with, uh, with, with such a plan. And this includes slightly higher year-to-date zinc and aluminum prices, uh, a significantly lower coal price benchmark, which as we know has been a significant driver of uh, Vedanta's uh, cost of production for zinc and aluminum uh, commodities. And I think there are also indications that the zinc market is looking somewhat tight with a slight backwardation of the futures curve. So this could suggest that uh, zinc prices could, uh, could, do, uh, could do well in the near term. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Vedanta Limited or what we call VDL, uh, the share price has been largely uh, range bound. And I think what we have observed in the past is that VDL's share price tend to be somewhat correlated with the VRL. Uh, dollar bonds, or even X, a slight uh, leading in indicator on certain occasions. So this suggests to us that markets are still um, somewhat concerned with Vedanta's near-term liquidity challenges, despite some positive uh, fundamental developments on the commodities front. Th thanks, jung -Guan. Um So after setting the scene around the company's funding gap, um, do you think you could outline some potential scenarios to, ad to address the liquidity challenges? Yeah, sure, Jeff. So uh, I think the way for us to think about uh, what's next for Vedanta is really through, uh, uh, by outlining our thinking through uh, four main scenarios. Uh, what I'll do here is I will talk about four broad scenarios on a high level. And uh, I believe you and Malvika will be elaborating specifically on at least a couple of them. Uh, we think clearly Vedanta uh, has options, uh, but we don't think that there are easy choices to make. Uh, because as you, as you see, all of these uh, four broad scenarios come with uh, trade, trade offs that should be carefully considered. Uh, I, also, I also want to point out that some of the scenarios and options here are not mutually exclusive, and we could see some overlaps or combination of options. So, with that in mind, let's uh, zoom into scenario one on the top left hand side. Uh, our colleagues have previously reported VR was contemplating a 1.5 billion financing plan. And this includes uh, the upsizing of the Oak Tree loan notes and various form of bank financing support. Uh, while we didn't think that this would have been enough, uh, 1.5 billion would certainly buy Vedanta a, a decent amount of time to explore more solutions. Uh, Malvika will talk more about this, but clearly the main trade-off here would be a slower pace of deleveraging for VRL. And given that we are in a high interest rate environment, this entails a higher uh, interest burden. Now, moving to scenario two on the top right, this involves asset and stick sales. Uh, and Malvika will talk a bit more about the THL deal. Uh, aside from this related party uh, deal that everyone is focusing on, uh, we think that if VRL is truly willing to meet its debt obligations, there are other possibilities here, including trimming its uh, VDL stick by as much as 10 to 20% and use the debt proceeds and use the proceeds for debt repayment, excuse me, uh, while still retaining control of VDL. Now, for various reasons, this option may be somewhat unpalatable to uh, sponsors because of the earlier privatization attempt and the wish to minority leakage, but we think it's not um, entirely impossible either. Excuse me. Other businesses uh, within the group could also be sold, such as the one with K in India, uh, but they tend to be somewhat on the smaller side and, and may not be as meaningful when it comes to addressing uh, VRLs more uh, well, when it comes to addressing VRL's near-term um, large maturity wall. Now, the trade-off for scenario two would be because of the, um, uh, because of the uh, domestic importance of Vedanta's major businesses, uh, we think that any large-scale asset sales would probably involve the government of India in some way, shape, or form, as we're already seeing. And uh, to put it mildly, this may not be straightforward. Uh, also, any reduction in the VDL stake when uh, liquidity challenges are, are mounting could negatively affect the, the sales price, right? And, and this will, of course, also further increase uh, minority leakage in the future. So that's scenario two. Uh, 
let's touch on scenario three on the bottom left hand side and this is more of a downside scenario uh, but i suppose it's also probably on the at the back of people's mind uh, for a while now fundamentally we, we think that given vedanta's uh, you know very vast commodity reserves and mining life that stretch to the decades there is a clearly a fundamental asset and liability mismatch uh, it also doesn't help that the underlying commodity prices can be uh, fairly volatile. And this volatility is further amplified by uh, operating and financial leverage that's built into the system. So economically, we think an LME can provide a longer uh, liability duration profile. And this would give uh, Vedanta better ability to weather the volatility that is inherent in its, in its business. And another advantage would be that management would then be less distracted with the next short-term uh, maturity wall. A, a longer, we think that a longer liability duration profile would also give Vedanta um, more uh, good opportunities, I should say, uh, to put on commodity hedges that would improve its earnings visibility, right, and better support its debt stack with greater certainty. Now, we note that the company has been more active in carrying out hedging since uh, fiscal 2022, uh, when prices are high, and, and we, we think that this is a credit positive development and something to watch out for in the days ahead. Uh, now, the trade-off with an LME is if VRL decides to uh, do so, right, the, the credit worthiness of the group will certainly take a meaningful hit in the, in the short to uh, medium term. And this would probably lead to a higher cost of debt financing and fewer uh, uh, financing options potentially. Now, lastly, uh, let me briefly touch on scenario four on the bottom right-hand side. Uh, this includes some other options that we think are also possible just to uh, round things off. Uh, take, for example, we know that VDL has been on the deleveraging trend over the last uh, few fiscal years, and depending on, on uh, other covenants or other strategic considerations that may be in place, we think that there can be capacity to gear up the opcos to facilitate more uh, upstreaming of dividends. Uh, I think already we are hearing that uh, Hindustan Zing is reclassifying 104 billion rupees of uh, from general reserves to, to retain earnings, right? Perhaps in anticipation of uh, more dividends uh, in the near term. Uh, I think also uh, it, it, just as noteworthy is that uh, not too long ago in, in May, 2022, uh, Riyadh reported that VDL encumbered as much as 5.8% of Hindustan Zing shares for a uh, rupee term loan. That is uh, $1 billion equivalent for the benefit of, I believe it's UBI. Uh, we also note that there was a further 1% share pledge of Hindustan Zing in December 22 to, to top up the, perhaps to top up the asset coverage of that loan. Uh, so we think that there's certainly some uh, options on the upco level, but as I said, there could be some uh, covenant or, or strategic uh, considerations to, to bear in mind. Uh, I think previously, uh, also not too long ago, perhaps a few fiscal years ago, we have also seen more brand fees charged uh, by VRL against VDL. Right, and, and provision of intercore loans. So these are you know, uh, additional uh, avenues or existing avenues that could result in uh, more liquidity upstream to, to VRL to service uh, its debt. Now, the trade-off uh, for scenario four uh, would be given the bulk of the value resides at the op course, uh, we think sponsors might be prioritizing clean balance sheets there and, and do not really want to rock the boat too much uh, at, at the op core level. Uh, we also think that given VDL's uh, equity value has been providing the bulk of credit support to, uh, to debts at uh, the whole core intermediate whole core levels, right? That could be perhaps some kind of covenants being put in place or, or some further considerations that are uh, being uh, uh, that are being thought of, right? That could result in a fairly uh, narrow limit to introduce more debts to the to the upcoast to be upstream to the whole call to service whatever that needs to be uh, upstream, right? So uh, over back back over to you, Jeff. Thank, thanks, JT. Uh, thanks for walking us through those those four possible scenarios. So it really does look like the company has a number of levers, but some serious trade offs to consider. Malvika, I think this is probably a good time to bring you in. Um, I now want to move on to the potential THL zinc acquisition. Uh, do you think you could set out at a high level what the proposed transaction involves, which corporate entities are involved, and what is the cash consideration? Uh, sure, Jeff. Uh, at the outset, uh, since you uh, you know since you asked this question around uh, the DHL Zinc transaction, 
uh, uh, you know, it would be good to clarify that although the transaction was announced by Hindustan Zinc in January uh, this year, but we have seen and have reported that the government has uh, very strongly opposed this transaction. So right now, uh, the fate of this transaction clearly looks a bit uncertain, quite uncertain, actually. Um, just, uh, you know, now coming to the question that you asked, uh, you know, about this particular transaction, what it really uh, uh, what the transaction really is. Uh, it basically involves uh, Hindustan Zinc, which is an onshore subsidiary of Vedanta Limited, buying out uh, THL Zinc, which is an offshore unit of Vedanta Limited again, for a consideration of around uh, 2.98 billion US dollars. And uh, I think uh, over here, uh, Vedanta Limited would obviously be uh, a related party. Uh, very clearly. And uh, uh, talking about the shareholders involved, uh, this, this transaction would basically require uh, the minority shareholders in this case, both on the side of uh, Vedanta Limited as well as Hindustan Zinc to vote on this transaction. And uh, on on the on uh, for uh, Hindustan Zinc, the minority shareholders would primarily be the government of India, Life Insurance Corporation, which is again government-owned, uh, life in, uh, state-owned life insurer, uh, and uh, other public shareholders. Uh, whereas on the side of uh, Vedanta Limited, it would primarily be LIC and other public shareholders. So just to uh, you know, uh, yeah, this is th these are the broad contours of the transaction that was actually proposed. But as we know, there is a lot of opposition, so. Uh, we don't see this deal happening anytime soon. It definitely not this quarter for sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Malvika. JT, can can I bring you back in here as I have a question from the audience? Do you think do you think you could talk to some of the potential dynamics around LIC's voting on that potential THL transaction? Uh, I'm noting that you're not an Indian lawyer, so I realise it's a little unfair. But I know we had been discussing this a bit. bit previously yeah 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 sure jeff i guess that that question is probably at the top of uh, everyone's mind mm. uh, but maybe for me to better establish the context let me just uh, very quickly bring out a, a detailed corporate structure chart so that everyone has a visual reference uh jeff do you see a, the detailed corporate I structure do. yes chart? thanks for bringing okay. that up yeah. yeah no problem so Based on what we uh, understand so far about the definition of related party in, in this context, using references uh, in SEBI documents as well as Sinistanzing documents, uh, a plain read to us would suggest that uh, the government of India's holdings of 20, 29%, as you can see in, um, in, in VDL, uh, is likely to be considered that of a related party and it may not be entitled to vote in the transaction. So this would be where the rate boxes on the right-hand side would be. Uh, and if that's indeed the case, uh, well, clearly voting uh, would hinge on the minority shareholder, uh, Life Insurance Corporation of India or LIC in short, which, uh, well, interestingly, is also ultimately a majority owned by the government of India. Uh, it's somewhat strange to us that LIC may not be considered a related party in this context as we would normally do uh, in other market situations that we, we have observed simply by uh, virtue of common uh, ownership. So um, if let's say we are right uh, and, and it's indeed the case, uh, LIC will vote on the VDL level as a 9% shareholder and, and, and a 2.7% shareholder on, on the Hindustan Zing level. Uh, but Given what we have seen so far about the government's, uh, I would say, fairly uh, explicit opposition to the deal, uh, we think that could, uh, well, that's likely to have significant bearing on LIC as well, should the vote be called. So being a 2.7% shareholder at Hindustan Zing, uh, small as it is, uh, would actually mean in the minority context that LIC is almost certainly able to block the deal at that level. Uh, assuming the assuming VDL and uh, the India government are excluded as, as related parties, which is what I believe Malvika is hearing from the sources. And putting all of that aside, and if we were to take a step back and look at the big picture, uh, we think the government is really here as a de facto partner to Vedanta in many ways, right? Uh, this includes the setting of royalty rates for, for its primary businesses, uh, setting import tariffs uh, for the zinc and aluminum business, 
perhaps influencing SOE bank financing as well, uh, licensing, etc. I mean, I could go on and on. So it, it makes a lot of sense to, to us that uh, Vedanta or VRL in this case should strongly um, uh, heed and, and respect the government's wishes, right? And, and not be overly confrontational. Uh, so yeah, I, that, I know that, that was a bit of a long answer, but I hope that no, I, no, no, I think that's very helpful, Jung Guan. Thank yeah, you, thank yeah, you very much sure. for that. Um, Malvika, d- t- going back, turning back to you now, um, and I know you know skepticism around a proposed transaction. You know, so so get, maybe you could give listeners a, a little bit more insight as to as to how that proposed THL deal is going. Uh, yeah, Jeff. So. Uh, you know, when the deal was announced in January, uh, you know, people uh, think the bondholders, especially the USC bondholders, were euphoric. And uh, people actually thought that this was a masterstroke uh, by, you know, the company uh, that, you know, it would have helped in meaningfully dev- uh, deleveraging, right? So, but then it clearly looks like, uh, you know, as we have seen over the last week or so, that there is a very strong opposition by the government. And uh, uh, one of the things, uh, I, the Ministry of Mines, uh, in its letter, uh, which which was uh, you know uh, publicly uh, notified, uh, you know shared by the company Hindustan Zinc uh, last week, was basically the letter spoke about that you know government in the, uh, would re- uh, continue opposing the deal in its current structure. Uh, and if required, if the company still continues to pursue it, it would uh, it could consider taking legal recourse. However, interestingly, one of the one one thing which uh, uh, you know that letter mentioned was uh, Hindustan Zinc could actually consider cashless methods uh, of acquiring THL Zinc, uh, which would basically uh, uh, you know in uh, from what we understand, it could either be uh, through a uh, share swap or, uh, you know, Vedanta Limited putting in some equity into uh, Hindustan Zinc and helping the government to partially offload the stake, which anyway the government is trying to do as part of its uh, disinvestment strategy. Having said that, uh, I think uh, the company had given a guidance in January that, uh, uh, you know, it would, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it was, it's, Sounded sure actually the management sounded sure that by February end they would be able to get uh, the shareholder approval for this uh, transaction and uh, that's all that was required for it and uh, the cash would immediately come in uh, but that obviously doesn't seem to be the case because uh, you know in response to the government's letter which uh, came from Ministry of Mines uh, Hindustan Zinc has basically uh, informed the stock exchanges and has responded to the government saying that it is it has not gone ahead and uh, uh, you know sent out a notice for the shareholder uh, voting process which at least needs to be put out a month in advance uh, before you know the voting actually happens so that has not uh, that has not happened but uh, i that's 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 uh, uh, you know it clearly shows that uh, the deal is on hold at the moment uh, and uh, one of the things which stands out is uh, you know uh, obviously it, it seems uh, pretty clear that there were actually uh, no back channel discussions that were uh, done by Hindustan Zinc or Vedanta with the government before announcing this deal. And actually, if you see the board, there are three uh, nominees on the Hindustan government nominees on Hindustan Zinc board, and they have dissented. Uh, uh, you know, they have uh, voted against this transaction during the board meeting. Uh, you know, which was conducted prior to the announcement. So uh, I think it's it just seems like a repeat of 2020 where we saw, uh, you know, Vedanta Limited trying to, uh, Vedanta Resources trying to deal as Vedanta Limited, which is the Indian uh, list co. And, uh, 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 you know, LIC was really not on board. And, uh, uh, you know, then thereafter, I think, uh, you know, the transaction actually failed and the, the company was not able to get Vedanta Limited delisted. So I think for now, uh, it, you know, I just feel uh, based from our what our sources say that you know we can forget about this deal at least for the interim. Yeah. Got, got it. Thank, thank you, Malvika. Um, just <laughs> again noting, noting, noting what you're saying there about perhaps this proposed transaction not not likely to go through. But if it if it were to go through, how you know how would this transaction alleviate the funding gap mentioned uh, at the VRL level? 
uh, yeah, sure. So if you see, uh, uh, you know, how, how this transaction was structured, and I think I'll come to that later, why probably there is opposition from the government, uh, is if you see, uh, you know, and we have reported that, uh, uh, you know, Vedanta Resources has been trying to raise uh, overall around, uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, for the past few months, actually, a few quarters, actually, we say, uh, to raise as much as two billion uh, US dollars to basically refinance uh, a loan facility from uh, Oak Tree Capital as well as uh, you know uh, refinance some of its upcoming maturities. However, uh, you know these transactions have not really gone through as we've seen. Um, and uh, so, what this transaction, uh, the THL Zinc transaction, could have done for the company is. Uh, you know, once uh, Vedanta Limited would have sold uh, THL Zinc uh, uh, to Hindustan Zinc, uh, it would have immediately got uh, this entire $2.98 billion, uh, which it could have thereafter upstreamed uh, to Vedanta Resources as a special dividend. And if you see uh, Vedanta Resources shareholding in uh, Vedanta Limited is around 69.69%, uh, uh, right? So approximately $2 billion could have immediately gone to uh, uh, Vedanta Resources, which is exactly the kind of amount they're trying to actually raise uh, through debt. Uh, so I think this transaction would have uh, helped Vedanta Resources to meaningfully deleverage and at the same time, you know, do away with uh, uh, the other uh, debt, uh, other refinancing options that the company is exploring. So yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's how the transaction would have really helped. Thank, thanks very much. And so I, I can sense maybe you're wanting to talk a little bit more about the government's opposition to the proposed THL deal. Do you want to uh, to go into some more detail around that? Yeah, so uh, Jeff, like I, I just mentioned that, you know, one of the things uh, uh, that the government in its letter uh, to Hindustan Zinc, it, it, they've mentioned that the uh, Hindustan Zinc could actually go ahead and explore other cashless methods uh, to uh, acquire uh, THL Zinc. So I think one of the reasons is obviously, I think, uh, uh, is the, uh, uh, the, 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 prop, the concerns are around the valuation that is being, uh, that is, that is being quoted for uh, THL Zinc. I think uh, for, for government right now, the, it's, it's also a function of timing, right? So uh, in the stands, uh, in, uh, government is trying to um, you know, partially offload its uh, stake in Hindustan Zinc as part of its disinvestment strategy. And at the same time, you know, Hindustan Zinc wants to go ahead and acquire this asset, which is largely going to be cash funded in its current structure, or which would have been largely cash funded in its current structure, right? So I think this would lead to a lot of cash outflow, um, and which I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, keeping aside the concerns around valuation, it would lead to a lot of sudden cash outflow, which could mar the valuations for the government. So I think that is uh, that is the primary uh, uh, issue, besides the fact that, you know, during the board meeting, actually, despite the fact that government nominees actually were not on board with the with this res resolution, the company actually went ahead and announced the deal. I mean, uh, it would be really nice to actually think that you could sidestep uh, the government and you know go ahead with the transaction. So yeah, I think. Got it. Th 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 thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, well, perhaps now we turn to you know all this talk of prospective financing. Do you think you'd be able to give us an update on the company's proposed financing plans? Uh, I mean, where do the plans stand, and what are the market sentiments around them? So I think historically, I, uh, we have seen, right, uh, uh, as as a firm, uh, Vedanta. Uh, you know, obviously, it's a it's 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 a story of refinancing over and over again, and we've seen that uh, they come up with transactions at the last minute. Something or the other gets done, but then that you know you just keep waiting till the last minute, and you know, in anticipation that what the company would do. So uh, the you know we we just reported today actually uh, uh, I'll come to the other uh, refinancing options that the company has been exploring for the past many months and uh, we are yet to see any closure but uh, the latest that we have heard and reported today uh, is uh, that uh, 
uh, Vedanta Resources is basically trying to raise money at Zinc International, which is a hundred percent offshore subsidiary of Vedanta Limited, and uh, raise money over there and probably uh, you know upstream. Uh, the funds raised as a special dividend. Uh, you know, we we don't know exactly all uh, the details how how the upstreaming would be done, but this is something which is which is still in its preliminary stages, and uh, uh, this is something which is being explored at the international level. Um, having said that, while this is you know something which is which is uh, probably still in its early stages of discussion. Um, I think uh, the other options uh, which which we have extensively reported about is uh, how Vedanta Resources is trying to raise money at the Oak Tree Box, which are basically three subsidiaries where uh, the 750 million loan facility from uh, Oak Tree Capital actually rests. And over there, uh, you know, the company has been in discussions with special situation funds to raise as much as $1.5 billion. And uh, the pricing that we understand uh, uh, from our sources that, that that is being quoted is around 17%. Um, and again, that's quite exorbitant, right? Uh, and uh, other than that, the company during its various earnings calls has also uh, mentioned that it is trying to raise uh, around $500 million from uh, the Indian state-owned banks as well as some of the global banks. But we are yet to see um, you know, closure of any of those loan transactions within the oak tree box. So this is one thing which is which is in the works, obviously. Uh, the second piece that we uh, you know reported last week is uh, 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 that Vedanta Resources is actually uh, uh, you know uh, they have reached out to some of the relationship banks, some of the global banks, uh, to raise uh, as much as five hundred million at Winstar, which is a set step down subsidiary of Vedanta Resources, a separate from the Oak Tree Box. And uh, over here, I think there is some uh, there is some headroom around uh, of 250 million that is available to raise uh, additional debt. And I think over and above that, there are certain loan maturities uh, next quarter, which includes, I think, a 250 million uh, repayment to Standard Chartered Bank and 100 million repayment to uh, DBS as well. So I think there is some reluctance or caginess in, with, uh, among the banks to roll over uh, these loans at this point of time. So I think uh, the the funding that is going to be raised at uh, which which the company is trying to raise at Winstar would primarily go towards uh, uh, refinancing some of these uh, upcoming loans. Then obviously uh, uh, the other other option that uh, you know uh, uh, we have mentioned about and we've recently seen that uh, how uh, Hindustan Zing basically announced uh, that they're going to conduct uh, a shareholder vote for uh, transferring funds from general reserve to retain earnings. Uh, this is in line with what we have reported is that the company uh, obviously will have to dip uh, or may have to dip uh, into Hindustan Zing's cash for uh, bridging any shortfall and God forbid if uh, you know these transactions that are under discussion they don't close, they will have to heavily rely on uh, Hindustan Zinc's cash. So yeah, these are some of the options uh, you know that are in the works, but we are yet to see a uh, uh, closure of any of these transactions. Yeah. I think, My apologies. Uh, Jeff, we are, I think we are facing a bit of uh, technical difficulties. Jeff has just uh, dropped off. Uh, but essentially, the next segment of this uh, webinar, uh, I think what we are going to be focusing on is uh, given uh, what we are seeing on, on some of the uncertainties around uh, meaningful asset sales, such as the TH housing deal, or, or, or the uncertainties as it relates to uh, prospective financing, as Malvika has very kindly walked us through. Uh, we just thought it'd be really uh, useful to round off the discussion today with a brief uh, overview of uh, Vedanta, Vedanta Resources uh, issuance and credit structure uh, for, its for its dollar bonds, just to uh, explore a little bit more uh, on, on, on what the downside scenario could look like. Uh, so I don't see Jeff coming on. But nonetheless, uh, you know, the discussion that we are about to have is really very much based on a uh, legal analysis that uh, Jeff published uh, 
in January, uh, which uh, our subscriber and trialists will have access to. Uh, I think just to facilitate that discussion, uh, I think what we can do is to pull up the, again, the detailed corporate structure of uh, Vedanta resources, right? I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and let uh, people and give people a better sense of the lay of the land here. Uh, as you know, Vedanta resources uh, corporate structure is a sprawling one. Uh, there are complex chains of ownership. And even though we know that VRL owns uh, something like two thirds of VDL, really that ownership is uh, via uh, a few chains of corporate ownership, right? Uh, I want to point out the first chain would essentially be through the Twin Star Holdings box over here. Uh, as you can see, Twin Star and Welter, these two uh, entities, or what we call the intermediate whole coals combined, uh, would have 47% of uh, VDL, right? And Malvika was alluding to uh, the Oak Tree box earlier. Uh, by the way, I just want to mention that uh, this uh, corporate structure is uh, available to REOC subscribers and trialists uh, on the REOC web website under the Vedanta resources entry. Now, uh, going back to the Oak Tree box, it's, uh, it's at the bottom left-hand side of this uh, chart that we are seeing, right? So uh, it's essentially Vedanta Holdings Mauritius II and Finsider International, uh, which combine have... Uh, something like 17, 18% of uh, VDL. This represents the second largest uh, group of holdings. Uh, the other intermediate holdings uh, are smaller and tend to reside at various uh, entities such as, uh, I would flag Vedanta Holdings Mauritius Limited, as well as uh, Vedanta Netherlands Investment here uh, Limited, which has 1.7%, right? Uh, so uh, just very briefly in a nutshell, this is how the uh, uh, VRL simplified corporate structure actually looks like. Um, okay, I still don't see Jeff. Okay, never mind. Let me uh, briefly talk about the uh, credit structure of Adanta resources and uh, what uh, audiences and investors should perhaps watch out for if they are uh, looking at VRL, VRL's bonds. So uh, in the analysis that uh, I mentioned that we published uh, in January last month, uh, really our focus was on the 1 billion, 6.125% uh, bond that was due August 2024, uh, issued by Vedanta Resources, which uh, I'll call VRL again in short, right? So this is the one that is over here that I'll highlight briefly. Uh, and... Uh, Sorry, I mean this one billion, uh, six point one two five percent due August twenty twenty four that was uh, issued by VRL, and I think the other point of focus that we had was on the uh, one billion, uh, thirteen point eight seven five percent due uh, January twenty twenty four uh, notes that's uh, issued by Vedanta Resources Finance two or what we call uh, VRF two in short, and uh, really uh, this. Subsequent part of the discussion that I'm about to have with you uh, will largely be based around these two bonds as uh, examples of the point that we have to bring. Uh, I see Jeff uh, coming uh, on again. Hey, oh, Jeff, gosh, are you on? What, that's, yes, that's not what you want, is it? Ah, on you crash out the a you crash at the wrong time. So I was just walking. I was just walking the audience through about the recent uh, work uh, which we publish uh, and how we were focusing on the uh, 1 billion uh, Gen 2024 bond that was issued by VRF2 as a point of focus. And as a contrast, uh, we also looked at the 1 billion 6.125% bond due August 2024 that is issued on the VRL uh, level. Yeah, that's right. So why don't I hand it over back to you to uh, talk about the issuance and credit structure of these solid bonds and some considerations around uh, subordination issues and, and uh, some thinking around potential recovery impact as we explore uh, how a downside scenario could play out if some of the asset sales and prospective financing uh, deals don't, don't, don't work out. Yeah, no, no trouble. Thank you. You've gone uh, above and beyond, sir. Um, right. And, and I know that you're going to kindly assist me by uh, continuing to highlight the various entities on the, on the corporate structure chart as I go along. So, um, 
as you'll see from the simplified corporate structure, Vedanta Resources utilizes a dual issuance structure, issuing its dollar bonds out of VRL and VRF2. VRL is the broader Vedanta Group's hold co, and as we heard before, it is it, its primary asset is its 69.7% stake in Vedanta Limited. However, according to, to corporate filings, this stake is encumbered by other creditors. The other dollar bond issuer is VRF2. It is a subsidiary of VRL, and it on lends the net proceeds from its bond issues to VRL. Its assets are the receivables under those loans. Uh, neither of the bonds have security packages, but the due January 2024 bonds issued by VRF2 are guaranteed by VRL. Uh, they also have subsidiary guarantees from Twinstar Holdings Limited and Welter Trading Limited. However, I think I probably should point out that there are differences amongst the dollar bonds issued by VRF2. Uh, for example, the 1.2 billion 8.95% guaranteed bonds due 2025, which are issued by VRF2, have the same guaranteed package as the due January 24 bonds. However, the 400 million due 2023 and 600 million due 2026 bonds, also both issued by VRF2, only benefit from a parent guarantee provided by VRL not the subsidiary guarantees which benefit the January 24 bonds and the due 2025 bonds. So for this discussion, I'll, I'll keep focusing on those dollar bonds issued by VRF2, benefiting from both the VRL parent guarantee and the subsidiary guarantees provided by Twinstar and Welter Trading. So digging into those subsidiary guarantors a little more, Twinstar and Welter, both of them are finance vehicles. So they likely have limited value aside from their respective equity stakes in Vedanta Limited. And as a combined intermediate hold goes, Twin, Twin Star and Welter effectively hold the bulk of VRL stake in Vedanta Limited. Um, but as I noted before, the stakes in Vedanta Limited are already encumbered by the creditors. So briefly turning to subordination considerations, the dollar bonds issued by VRL are structurally subordinated to the creditors of VRL subsidiaries. This includes the dollar bonds issued by VRF2. When considering the wider indebtedness, so indebtedness which is structurally senior to the dollar bonds issued by VRL, this also includes indebtedness at the Twin Star, Welter Trading, Hindustan Zinc, BHM2, and Vedanta Limited level amongst others. In terms of indebtedness, which is structurally senior to the dollar bonds issued by both VRL and VRF2, this includes the non-convertible debentures issued by Hindustan Zinc, and the indebtedness at Vedanta and the Oak Tree loan notes borrowed by VHM2. Secured indebtedness, including those NC, NCDs issued by Vedanta Limited and the Oak Tree Loan Notes, enjoy security over the Vedanta Limited shares. So this raises collateral subordination considerations for the bonds issued by both VRF2 and VRL. Furthermore, secured indebtedness at the VRL level represents additional collateral subordination considerations for both sets of dollar bonds. Moving on to potential recovery in any downside scenario, recovery for the for VRL's dollar bonds would be driven through claims at the VRL level. Recovery for the dollar bonds issued by VRF2 would be driven through claims at VRL at the VRL level, both in its capacity as a parent guarantor and borrower under any on lent proceeds from VRF2. And I think these claims are likely parried pursue with claims against VRL under the VRL issued dollar bonds. There would also be claims, of course, at the twin star and welter trading level, given their capacity as subsidiary guarantors. Um, as I noted earlier, though, value at VRL, twin star and welter trading is, is, is derived through their respective equity stakes in Vedanta Limited, which have been encumbered by the other creditors. I think in addition, it's probably worth noting that Twinstar has entered into multiple credit facilities with Welter Trading providing guarantees for such facilities. 
Therefore, any claim under the subsidiary guarantees, which some of the dollar bonds issued by BRF2 benefit from, could be diluted by claims under the credit facilities or guarantees in a downside scenario. Depending on whether the credit facilities at Twinstar are secured, which most appear to be, claims under the Twinstar subsidiary guarantee are likely to be subject to collateral subordination. Furthermore, claims under the subsidiary guarantees would be structurally subordinated to indebtedness of Twinstar and well to trading subsidiaries. These subsidiaries include Vedanta Limited and Hindustan Singh, amongst others. So therefore, despite the different credit enhancement packages and the structural subordination considerations, which theoretically could result in different recovery considerations even between the dollar bonds, it appears that the differing recovery prospects between the USD bonds issued by BRL and BRF2 may, be, may in fact be minimal. The economic reality, given the subsidiary guarantors encumbered stakes held in Vedanta Limited against significant indebtedness and the lack of any further value residing at those entities, likely reduces the benefit of the subsidiary guarantees, um, which are offered to some of the BRF2 issued dollar bonds. So where does that leave us? Really, given the, that, that looming maturity wall, this could mean that temporal subordination considerations may be more important for holders of the dollar bonds. Um, I think, so now, given the uncertainty surrounding those potential financings and that proposed THL transaction, I think I now wanted to briefly cast an eye on potential downside scenarios and turn to the money term amendment provisions of the dollar bonds issued by both BRL and BRF2. Um, if you could just kindly go back to the slide deck, Jung Guan, uh, that I'd be most grateful, thank you. Um, so when talking about money term amendments, I'm referring to amendments would, which for example, would alter the maturity, the principal or the coupons of the dollar bonds. Uh, the dollar bonds use an English law construction for their money term amendment provisions, and this involves a bondholder meeting mechanism. Calling a meeting involves a quorum of two or more persons representing two thirds or at any adjourned meeting one third of the principal outstanding amount of the dollar bonds in question. Then at the meeting, an extraordinary resolution needs to be passed to approve those money term amendments. So extraordinary resolutions often have a 75% approval threshold. However, the dollar bonds only require approval from two thirds of the votes cast at that meeting to pass an extraordinary resolution. Therefore, the lower threshold is, is beneficial for the dancers issuers, given the provision really operates as a contractual cram in against any dissenting bondholders. Um, so in terms of any future liability management exercise, which is discussed in real tear sheet, given, given the amendment provision, a consent solicitation could be an available option. Uh, this would avoid the need for an exchange offer. And given the construction of the amendment provision and the approval thresholds detailed previously, this, this provides a more easily accessible cram in than, for example, an English law scheme of arrangement or restructuring plan as the approval threshold uh, for those statutory cramings is higher at 75%. The English law construct can also be contrasted with a money term amendment provision under New York law governed notes. Uh, New York law governed notes often require unanimous creditor consent to amend money terms, which makes consent solicitations an unattractive option for an issuer. Here, the English law construction, and in particular, that lower than usual approval threshold to pass a special resolution appears to be advantageous to the Vedanta should it need to launch a liability management exercise for the dollar bonds. So that concludes the slide portion of the presentation and we can now uh, move on to some Q&A. So let's see what questions have uh, come in so far Bear with me. Um, looks like there's uh, already some for, for Jung Guan. Um, so JT, here's one. What are some of the key assumptions that went behind the projections and the funding gap that you spoke spoke about? And what else do you think people should watch out for? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jeff. I guess uh, people want to get a sense of the inner workings of the model that was used to drive the 
uh, estimate of the funding gap. Uh, but I guess given that this is a webinar and, and for brevity, uh, I'll just talk about some of the uh, major uh, drivers that are perhaps more significant. So the, the zinc pricing that was used in the projections range from uh, 2,500 per ton in the, in the bear case to about 3,000 per ton in the base case. And the zinc volumes that was used to model uh, some of the earnings in cash flow was about 780 kilotons. And uh, the, cost, the cost of production, uh, given easing coal prices, uh, is essentially a figure that implies something like a 50, 50, 50 to 55% uh, EBITDA, EBITDA margin thereabouts. Now, on the aluminum side, uh, again, the price used is 1,800 to 2,500 per ton. Uh, and the volume is about, call it, say, 2,200 kilotons, right? And uh, again, the uh, COP that was uh, built into the model, you know, implies a something like a high teens margins for, for the next uh, couple of fiscal years. So what we have seen is that coal prices uh, can be a significant driver of a COP. And, and with the weakening trend of coal prices uh, that uh, seems to be continuing, we think that could be helpful to margins in the, in the near term. Uh, and I suppose it may be worthwhile to add that aside from the funding gap and financing issues that we've mentioned, uh, I think we will also be keeping a close eye out for um, Vedanta's uh, hedging uh, policies, uh, the extent of hedging, the prices that which they have hedged at and, and the volumes, right? As well as the pace of China's reopening and how uh, that would further influence uh, base metal spot and, and, and future prices. I hope that answers the question, Jeff. Yeah, th th thanks, Chung Guan. I, I, I think that does. Thanks very much. Um, I've got another one for you, though. Um, how do you think a cashless transaction involving THL Zinc between BDL and, and Hindustan Zinc could be helpful towards deleveraging? <laughs> Okay, I, th I think that was a point that, that Malvika mentioned earlier. So, but I, okay, I'll give it a step. Uh, I, I think what we, as 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 what I'm as what we have uh, mentioned earlier, we, we saw in May 2022, VDL actually pledged Hindustan Zinc shares to raise financing. There was about a billion uh, dollars equivalent in uh in, in in I think it was a rupee term loan, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In favor of uh, a domestic bank UBI, uh, and there seemed to be a recent top up pledge in uh, December, right? So, uh. If let's say a share swap deal eventually transpires, uh, maybe that sort of structure uh, could be recycled, right? And VDL could consider raising more financing using uh, uh, Hindustan Zinc shares as as uh, as, as security. Uh, but as I mentioned, given that Hindustan Zinc's share values flow into Vedanta Limited's equity value, and a lot of the equity value is used to support uh, financing that's taken out. Uh, at the intermediate Hoko level, especially at Twin Star, right? Uh, there could be some kind of covenants put in place that we do not know of that could limit that kind of uh, leverage, leveraging up at an opco, right? And uh, I think sponsors would probably also want to keep, I mean, if they have a choice, they probably also want to keep uh, balance sheets relatively cleaner at the opco level and, and, and just make sure that the, the ship is stabilized you know, on those levels instead of also leveraging up on the opco level if they can help it. Got it. Sure. Th thank you very much. Um, and and a final question here, Malvika. This one for you. So, uh, what what do you think could be the key catalyst and trigger for Vedanta now? So, Jeff, um, I think uh, the triggers would all be interconnected, right? As we've seen, mm. I think one of the most crucial things would be how the company is able to manage the upcoming debt maturity, so which it is trying to arrange funding through various means. I think if that funding, uh, you know, one of the two transactions, one which we have reported today, which is in the works uh, for raising around $1 billion at Zinc International, that could be one option. The second is obviously the other one is the uh, funding that they're trying to raise at Oak Tree, which is around, uh, now actually that number is a little reduced, has come down a bit from 1.5 billion uh, to around 1.2 to 1.3 billion. So if any of these transactions fail to go through, I think it would have, uh, you know, it would require uh, uh, Vedanta resources to use up uh, the cash from the uh, subsidiaries, right? Uh, especially in the sun sake, where, you know, there's a risk of cash depletion. And consequently, uh, there could be a bearing, obviously, on the ratings of the opcos as well. So I think, 
uh, tying up these funds would be the key uh, thing to watch out for. Uh, and to what extent Vedanta is actually utilizing the cash, of, uh, you know, from its offers for uh, deleveraging. So I, I think it's a double-edged sword. Like one on, on one hand, people would want Vedanta to pair, uh, pair its debt using cash. But at the same time, uh, you know, if they heavily rely on this, it doesn't really send a very good signal to the market. So I think these would be the primary triggers for any uh, movement as far as, you know, particularly for the bonds, yeah. Got it, got it. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much for that. Well, uh, that's really all we have time for today. Um, as a reminder, Reorg is a global provider of credit intelligence, data and analytics for law firms, investors and advisors. If you're already a subscriber, please send any questions to customer success at reorg.com. Um, a replay will be available on the Real webinars and podcast page within two working days. The slide deck will be, be available as well. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today and a special thanks to our panelists and of course, those people working behind the scenes to produce the webinar. Uh, have a good remainder of your day.